So today I'm going to talk about creating the Bro RFB in C parser, and I made a small agenda for this morning. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit to you guys. Uh, then I'm going to give you some context on how we use Bro at Fox IT. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the dangers of VNZ. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the protocol itself. So the two red items are a little bit more technical than the other items. And after we, we've seen how the protocol works, uh, I'll tell you a bit what you can do with the RFB uh, analyzer. And we can ha discuss some ideas of future work. So uh, to, to introduce myself, I'm Martin van Hansberg. I work at Fox IT, which is situated in the, the Netherlands. I studied mathematics uh, originally, and I worked at Fox for quite some time. Uh, I had a small gap between 2011 and 2016, but I returned in January, and I got introduced to, uh, to Bro, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I work mostly as developer, but I also did some other security-related stuff, like PKI implementations and security audits and all that stuff. In 2000. So between 2007 and 2011, I worked on a, uh, a program called Fox Replay, which was made by uh, Fox IT. And it was essentially software for the lawful interception and forensic um, uh, companies. And it was software to create, uh, to full, uh, do full contact reconstruction of network data. So um, we did something similar to Bro in the sense that we had to reassemble TCP, UDP streams, build protocol analyzers, and get the full content out of all the uh, information. And not only metadata, but actually the contents of all the emails, uh, websites, etc. And we built a GUI on top of that so people could actually browse through someone's um, network activity. Um, so that required a lot of network protocol knowledge, uh, but the, the product no longer exists, but I can uh, use that network protocol knowledge in Bro nowadays. Um, so we use Bro at Fox IT, and we have mainly three major services where Bro uh, plays an essential role. And we call them passive audits, compromise assessments, and incident response. And they're all uh, three different answers to three different questions. So the passive audit is basically considering network data, and the customer wants to know what is basically happening on my network. They might not have network monitoring in place, uh, and someone asked them, I want to... Uh, to know and assess the, the level of security on your network, uh, and they, do, they ask us to do a passive audit, and we place a sensor in the network, uh, and we only look at the network data from a passive, uh, uh, from a passive viewpoint. With the compromise assessment, there, uh, a company might have a reasonable uh, uh, hunch that they might have been compromised, but they don't know if it's 100% sure that there is a compromise, or, um, and if there was a compromise, to what extent. And we do, do the network analysis, again, a uh, major part uh, with Bro, but we also take host analysis into account. And then in the last, uh, of course, incident response, then you're absolutely certain that there's something going on, and we do everything in our power to, uh, to contain the incident. So I'd like to talk a bit about the passive audit. So uh, I always tell customers that we take a photograph of your network by, by passively monitoring like four weeks of network traffic, and then we use a couple of tools to get a sense of uh, security level of your network. And of course, Bro is uh, on top of that list because basically 95% of the information that we gather uh, using those passive audits is using Bro. But we also use Suricata for uh, alerting and some custom tooling that we made. Um, obviously, I don't have to tell you this, but Bro gives a very, very detailed rundown on the protocols that are being used, the flow data, and Suricata gives us a lot of uh, hints on known bad. And this is my favorite triangle. Um, so we use Bro, Suricata, and Wireshark, and they actually play uh, very well together. So sometimes we would see an alert in Suricata, but we don't have a lot of context because uh, we only see the... the particular data stream that the alert triggered on. So we go back to Bro and do some more analysis on that. Maybe go from Bro to Wireshark. And sometimes we go from Bro, we do log analysis, and we see something weird, and we try to make uh, a snort rule out of it, et cetera. Um, so we use the strength of these uh, uh, products. And uh, analysis itself is a mix of automated and manual analysis. So we have a lot of standard questions that we want to, uh, to have answers to, uh, which is basically some standard bro commands. Uh, and we do also some uh, manual analysis that we actually go and hunt to see if we can find anything else 
rather than just a checklist, and we deliver a report on the, the security of the network. And some of the things that we look for are things like weak, weak protocols. You still see companies uh, sending sensitive information over FTP, SNTP, uh, some HTTP file sharing service, which has no uh, level of um, protection whatsoever. Uh, we can see all the SSL configurations of all the connections, so we can see self-signed certificates, weak RSA keys, the whole enchilada. Uh, my favorite is the plain text passwords. Uh, it's always fun to browse through them, uh, but it's also not only fun, but it's also very worthwhile because it tells you something about uh, how many people do actually reuse their passwords for different services. Um, do, is there some kind of enforcement of password policies? Those can all be seen by just looking at the bro data. Uh, we look at some weird traffic, like what I mentioned, like hunting and getting some context surrounding uh, alerts. We check for network segmentation issues. Sometimes we see people being able to connect from the guest Wi-Fi directly into the management LAN, which is obviously a bad thing. Uh, but this is, again, very visible using bro logs. Um, services exposed to the outside world. We see air conditioning air, uh, systems, air, uh, access control systems, all being exposed to the boundary of your network. So anyone on the internet can just tinker with your air code set settings. Uh, or open doors for you, and uh, remote administration tools. And of course, Bro does the, the RDP uh, protocol, and I thought, why not uh, RFB or VNC? Uh, uh, because they have been in the news lately. Um, before I go uh, to the dangers of the VNC, I would just like to tell you a little bit about VNC itself, because the number one question that I get asked is, why is it called the RFB protocol analyzer, and not the VNC protocol analyzer? Because everybody knows what VNC is. So I'd like to settle the argument with a wiki quote. Uh, in computing, virtual network computing is a graphical desktop sharing system that uses the remote frame buffer protocol. So VNC is the concept of being able to remotely uh, uh, control a GUI over the network from a different server, and it is the RFB protocol that allows you to do that. So it is aptly called the RFB protocol analyzer, but I used RFB and VNC interchangeably. Um, so the original spec was by Olivetti in 1998, and the first official version was 3.3, and later on it was maintained by Real VNC. And there are two additional uh, versions, official versions, the 3.7 and 3.8, and it's now published under RFC 6143, uh, and again maintained by Real VNC. And you probably already know this, but just to, uh, to get us started, uh, so how it works, you have a server that you want to control, uh, you want to control the GUI off, so you install an RFP server, for example, the real VNC server, uh, and it will listen on port uh, 5900, and you can use an RFP client, uh, VNC viewer, chicken of the VNC, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can connect over the network, and then you can just control the, the GUI of the server. So that really sounds like a neat idea, and uh, the question that uh, security guys always ask is, what could possibly go wrong? And uh, yeah. Well, I have uh, some uh, slides on the dangers of VNC. Um, my colleague Jonathan Kleinsma did some research lately on publicly reachable VNC servers on, an, uh, on the internet, and you wouldn't believe what he found. Uh, it's 2016, and VNC is like everywhere. Um, so there, he, you should really follow his tweet because he, he posts the, the best of the, the VNC uh, <laughs> uh, every once in a while on Twitter. So here we can see someone playing Pokemon Go, or actually cheating on uh, Pokemon Go. Uh, we can watch it live happening on the, VNC, uh, on, the, on the web. We can watch, enjoy people uh, working out at the University of Hawaii. So some of the um, uh, equipment there has uh, a VNC server, and you can watch people run, which is uh, better than running yourself. Uh, and this is all good and fun. Uh, you know, these are, are, are nice things. Until you look closer and you also see security cams being opened to the internet. You can watch your favorite uh, uh, um, reactor controller there. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this is a little bit more serious, and it's all open on the, the internet. And it gets even more serious uh, when you see uh, cardiac imaging devices being open on, uh, on the VNC uh, network. Um, actually, we saw patients' names and stuff on this, so we did some, uh, some disclosure there. Um, 
So you don't want to be on uh, on Shodan. So he uses Shodan for this uh, this kind of um, stuff. Um, but you can also just uh, follow Jonathan, and you'll get all the, the good stuff. Um, so what are the dangers? Well, uh, we see that there are VNC connections are, can, uh, open to medical devices, SCADA systems, factories, ho home uh, um, home systems like uh, uh, cameras, security cameras, and such. And uh, above all. The protocol isn't that all secure. So often there was no authentication required to connect to them, so we didn't even have to break in, into any passwords or whatsoever. And if there is some kind of authentication, it's usually not that strong. Uh, and the video stream is unencrypted for the, uh, in the default settings of most VNC servers. So there could be uh, a lot going on when you have VNC in your network, either at the boundary or internally. Uh, when you have this VNC. So I'm not saying that VNC is a bad thing. I mean, you can use it for good stuff, but uh, you should, should be aware of the dangers of just uh, installing VNC, click yes, install, and then uh, do nothing about it. Um, so we, I, uh, can, uh, since I was doing those passive audits and uh, my colleague was doing all this kind of stuff, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we do a passive audit and we could do, have some visibility on VNC servers uh, in the networks? So I decided I needed to make a bro wish list, like what kind of uh, security questions would we like to answer using bro, preferably uh, when it comes to VNC. So the main questions would be, are there RFB servers in the network? From where and where are they accessed, and for how long? Which software is being used? Can we tell something about that? What kind of authentication use? Was it successful? And maybe some other useful information. And it would be awesome if you maybe could, just like uh, Jonathan did, uh, create automatically be able to create screenshots of those kind of uh, streams. Um, but um, let's first start um, uh, go into the VNC protocol itself to see if we can find answers to these questions. Um, so I'm taking you a little bit into the more technical stuff now. Uh, unlike the SMB protocol that came along yesterday, the VNC protocol can be explained in 10 minutes. So uh, that's, uh, I'm glad I chose those just uh, protocol to build an analyzer for rather than the SMB one. But uh, basically, the VNC protocol has like three stages. You have a handshaking stage, uh, some initialization message stage, and uh, after that, you will get the, the frames of the, the GUI passing along. Um, so the first uh, part of when you connect to a VNC server, uh, you will initiate the protocol version handshake, which is a very simple handshake, because the server will just send uh, a banner with its version number, and the client will also send a banner. And it's very easy to parse. It's just a 12-byte string starting with RFB, and it has a, a major version number and a minor version number. And according to the official specs, uh, we expect that these are the only three versions out there um, in the world. But when you scan the internet uh, and you do a histogram of all the RFB uh, banners that we've encountered, you see some strange things. So 38, uh, 308, 307, and 303 are definitely up there. There's a mysterious 306. Um, there's 3889, which is attributable to Apple Remote Desktop Connection, because they also use uh, VNC with a custom authentication protocol. But if you see 3889 on your network, there's probably someone using Apple Remote Desktop. And we see 40 and 401, which is the real VNC uh, identification for the RP. Yeah. Is the X axis linear or large scale? Um, uh, this is, I, oh, that's a good question. Uh, because the, I think it was, uh, linear, yeah, um, and you see all these other RFB uh, uh, numbers here, uh, and that actually turn out to be honeypots. So there are many honeypots on the network, and each time that you connect to it, it will give you a random uh, protocol version number. So I think we can safely ignore those as being real VNC servers, but at least you can see that the protocol version handshake can give us a little bit of information on what kind of software is used. And I believe that the latest version of real VNC now is starting to use banner 5.0 and 5.0.1. So uh, the version numbers can be attributed to certain software, and it's also the case that we can learn what version of the protocol is being used, because it's the client's opinion of the, the protocol that is actually being talked for the rest of the, of the session. After we know uh, the server and the client know that they're both uh, RFB server and client, they do a security handshake. Uh, 
So the server basically sends a list of all the authentication types that it supports. There's a huge list of this. Uh, I haven't implemented them all. Uh, I did implement the no of the authentication required, which is very easy. Um, it's not uh, entirely secure, though. And there's the VNC authentication, which is basically the default uh, authentication type. And Apple made its own uh, authentication type, which has uh, number 30. Um, and when I, um, as a security uh, guy, when I hear authentication, I'm always wondering, are uh, usernames or uh, passwords sent in plain text? Well, with the VNC authentication, you only require a password and not a username. Um, and they did think about uh, plain text uh, passwords. Uh, so what they basically do, they, they do a challenge response protocol. So the server sends a 16-byte challenge to the client, and the client encrypts that with a password-derived key and sends the response back to the server. So it's not super fantastic secure, but at least you won't find any um, passwords uh, flying around in plain text. Or is there? Because when I was doing this uh, research, uh, I actually did a passive audit, and I came across a VNC server that had uh, built their own authentication type because they wanted to support usernames and passwords, and not just password. Uh, and I thought, hey, we'll just uh, make a username and password field, and we'll send that out unencrypted and in plain text over the network. So you never know what you find on your network. Um, I built support to, to parse this uh, as well, so you have a username and password uh, field in the in the logs. But I first want to check uh, if this is if this was just a one occurrence or if it's uh, rightly spread or not. But uh, it's nice to have this kind of information in your logs. Uh, and after the security handshake, uh, there's a security result handshake, which is basically the server stating uh, yes, the authentication was successful or not. So we always have um, explicit uh, confirmation whether or not authentication was successful, which is also very handy to have. And then uh, after the, uh, uh, the handshake has been completed, the client and the server both uh, start to exchange some technical details. The client can send a shared flag, which basically states if it wants to have exclusive access on the, on the server. Um, and the server will send a message like, hey, uh, this is the name of, uh, of the server, uh, this is my width and height of the, the screen that I am projecting, and then some uh, uh, encoding information, uh, which is not really interesting for our part at this point. But at least you have a name of the server and you have the dimensions of the, of the screen. And after that, the actual uh, screen information is being sent to the server. And there's a nice thing that after the initial handshake and the client and server init messages, the server will always send a complete representation of the current screen of the server. So this is a good place to try to make uh, a screenshot. And um, I'd I'll, I'll like to tell you a little bit how that works. So if, we have, if, if this is your server screen, so there's a Windows, so we're controlling a Windows uh, server, it actually divides up the screen into different rectangles, depending on pixel uniformity and whether or not uh, certain areas have changed or not. And it will divide them up into little uh, rectangles. And then each rectangle, uh, the pixel information gets compressed and encoded. And for each rectangle, a uh, VNC uh, server can choose a different compression algorithm or a compression, uh, different encoding algorithm, depending on the pixel uniformity, et cetera. Then all these uh, rectangles, all that information and the pixel data are placed into a message with a header on top stating, OK, I'm now sending you three uh, rectangles. And each rectangle has a position and a height and a width and the actual screen data. So when the client receives that information, it has enough information to uh, decode all the pixel information and present it on the client uh, screen. After the complete screen update, things are getting a little bit hairy because the client and the server can exchange messages uh, at will. Uh, so if I could uh, type something as a client or the server screen gets updated, they will pay, uh, transfer partial updates and that kind of stuff. So that gets a lot more hairier, uh, and I didn't look uh, into that. But at least we can see that after the initial handshake, um, there is a possibility there to, uh, to reconstruct the screen. So these are the, the, the basic stages of the VNC protocol. And let's see uh, what we gained from that. So uh, here's my wish list that I mentioned uh, for, uh, earlier. And we see the, the colored dots represent in what layer we can get the information for, uh, from. So the question, are there RFB servers in the network, we can answer by parsing the RFB uh, banners. Uh, from where and where are they accessed? We have the connection log for that. 
which software is used. We can use the version numbers to maybe attribute um, the service to a particular vendor. Um, we can see what kind of authentication used and uh, whether or not it was successful. And the useful information, uh, we saw that we can uh, get a server name and some screen dimensions. Uh, and the bonus exercise still, can we get a screenshot? Then we would have to parse um, the, the frame messages. So now that I know uh, what I want from, uh, from a parser uh, and where to get the information uh, from, I decided to actually build the parser. Uh, and you usually take this uh, approach. You first develop something, and then you test everything so everything works 100% uh, well, and then you deploy it. Sometimes the, the last two are a bit interchanged. But um, I, I, would, I would like to see more people building protocol parsers. That's why I um, decided to talk about this. So I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown on uh, if you want to start building protocol parsers yourself. Um, what kind of task are you getting yourself into? So at least you need, uh, when you have a protocol par when you want to build a protocol parser, uh, you would need uh, so Wireshark and loads of sample PCAPs because uh, you learn a lot by just looking at the network data itself rather than just taking the specs of a protocol and typing that in because uh, usually the specs don't really match reality. Uh, you need some knowledge of the bin pack uh, language and the bro policy writing and knowledge of the protocol. And there are basic uh, couple of layers. So you have the bin pack protocol parsing, where you define the events that you would like to, uh, to enable in the script land. Uh, you define all the protocol messages. Uh, and then bin pack uh, creates the C++ parser for you. So that's the easy part. Then you have the script land, where you make a policy, where you listen to all the events that you had. And you uh, put, uh, put all those in a nice, easy to read log file. And then you can use btest to actually make uh, unit tests for your protocol parser. Uh, if you want to start doing this, uh, there's documentation online. Uh, I found it very helpful to learn from existing protocol parsers just by uh, looking at the code and see what it, uh, what it does. Yesterday, binpack quick start got mentioned already, uh, which uh, creates some boilerplate code for you so you can immediately start uh, having uh, a boilerplate parser which compiles and does stuff for you. And there's a very, very great supportive community on the BroDev mailing list. Uh, so that's really great to be on that as well. And you have to be prepared for the two rules of uh, network protocol parsing. Uh, rule number one, no matter how simple the protocol is, there's always something there uh, which is a bit of a catch. Uh, and there's, no matter how well your protocol parser is, someone will always come up with you with a peek and say, hey, this doesn't work. Uh, what, what's, what gives? And of course, I encountered both. Uh, and that's, that's good that these rules remain true. Um, so let's see. Uh, no matter how simple the protocol is, there's always a catch. So ideally, and I'm going to reference SMB as a good example here, um, ideally you would have something like this. Uh, so you, you get a packet from the, from the wire, and you would expect it to have a header, which clearly states, I'm an RFB packet. Then it will have some kind of type, which will say to you, hey, I'm, uh, I'm containing this type of information. So you could easily split, OK, if I have something of type 1, I know that I have to parse the rest as a client version message, etc. Just like SMB does, it has an SMB header, and it clearly defines uh, what kind of command it contains, etc. But when you look at the protocol on RFB, uh, and I use Wireshark here, I have two messages here. One is a four-byte messenger a message called security types, which is four bytes long, and here also four bytes one. But here uh, Wireshark says it's authentication resolve. So. How can you distinguish if you have to interpret the four bytes as uh, a security type or as a uh, authentication result message? Well, the simple answer is uh, you can't just by looking at the packet. So you have to know that how you uh, parse those bytes it really depends on, on what stage you are in the, in the protocol. So uh, I had to implement some kind of state machine uh, that said um, that um, remembers where you are in the protocol. And it's, it, it's, it sounds difficult, but it was not that difficult to implement. Uh, so um, the RFB analyzer, just when it starts, it will set its uh, state to, I expect a server message. And then we can see here that uh, when an incoming message is, um, uh, is inbound, I check in what kind of state my protocol is. So in the first thing, uh, the first message will be a server banner. 
And when I parse a server banner uh, properly, I know that the next message is gonna be a client uh, message and a client protocol version message. So I adjust the state to awaiting client uh, message. And I just implement like a whole flow diagram going from awaiting server banner. If I had seen the server banner, I will say await client banner. I can also split between the different protocol versions because after I've seen the client banner, I know if we're gonna talk 3.3 or 3.7 and they have some subtle changes in the message types. And uh, I can do that until I finish uh, parsing the whole stuff. So it was, uh, it was a bit of a, a tricky stuff to do, but uh, in the end, it works perfectly. And this also has uh, added benefit that if there's somewhere along the line, if, I, if there's an authentication type that I haven't implemented, which kind of uh, confuses the state machine, then, okay, all the messages after that will not parse correctly, but we will always have seen the server banner and the client banner, so at least we will have that particular VNC server in our logs, even though we weren't able to uh, parse the entire stream. So that's how we can easily define um, RFB servers uh, on the network that aren't parsed correctly, uh, but um, you can send PCAPs to, to me to, uh, to eventually solve this. Uh, but that, that, was, uh, that was one thing that I had to do to make this work. And the other is no matter how well your protocol parse is, someone will come up with PCAP and nothing is uh, yeah, it's really true because I had submitted the, the, this to, uh, to Bro <laughs> and two days afterwards someone found uh, a PCAP that didn't work. <laughs> uh, so I fixed that and I also uh, came across that, uh, that custom authentication protocol with the plain text username password that didn't get, I hadn't seen that uh, authentication type, type mechanism so it didn't, didn't get parsed correctly. But I could identify it that there was a VNC server on the network just by the fact that we saw the surf and the client banners. So once we have our uh, bin pack protocol analyzer, uh, well, we have all these events in script land and just like uh, the SSL um, events that we saw yesterday, I followed the protocol quite uh, clearly. So, okay, so I found a server, a banner, a client banner, uh, etc. And there's a policy that takes all these events and it will generate a log for you. And I supplied a DPD signature, so if people are running VNC on a different port than 5900, uh, I will also parse them for you. Uh, question. Yes. Uh, have you experienced false positives just based on payload carried RFB? No, I haven't seen uh, any other uh, server or client uh, talking, uh, starting with RFB, that weren't actual RFB servers. So, yeah, that's a good point. It's always dangerous. Uh, 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 if I had forgotten the, the first character, the, like it should start with RFB, and I, I had forgotten that one, I might have had more uh, false positive. But so far, this uh, this works. Uh, in, in that case, it actually wouldn't have because they're implicit. You have to put it into the request request and then you have to put it. Oh, it's it's always starts at the. They're anchored to the beginning. Ah, okay. I, I usually do it just because it's clear. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so good point. <laughs> um, I also did a test, and the testing framework is also very easy, and also I think if you make a protocol analyzer, you should uh, take the effort to make uh, a test. It, it, it really takes you only maybe a couple of minutes to, to test. What you do is you just supply a sample PCAP, which you can probably generate in your lab. Uh, you don't want to have any sensitive information when you supply it uh, to the... To the a repository, of course. Uh, you specify the output that you expect and you supply a small test script which states uh, how Bro should be executed and uh, it tells uh, the testing framework that you want to diff the output of the, the, the running Bro instance with the reference log file. And then you have a profit. So I supplied two test cases, one uh, that I connect to Apple Remote Desktop and one VNC Mac to Linux. Uh, pick up. So you can run this if you check uh, check it out. So we now have a bin pack protocol, we have uh, policies, and we had tests, so it's time to deploy it. So you can just run uh, Bro on your favorite VNC PCAP, and this is the log that it creates, and it seems a little bit daunting to read like that, so this is a more readable version of it. So we display the major minor versions of the client and the server, authentication method VNC you see there, Authentication was successful, the share flag was set to true. Uh, I logged in as root 
on my uh, <laughs> on my virtual box machine, and these are the dimensions of my virtual box. Uh, now let's see, uh, can we all answer all the questions with this RFB log that we uh, post ourselves? Um, yes, are there RFB servers in the network? Uh, Procut will tell you immediately from where and when are RFB servers accessed and for how long. You can get that from the connection log, so the service field will, be, uh, will have an RFB field in there. Um, which software is used? Well, that question is, is not one-to-one uh, -one answerable, but at least we can get the version numbers of the RFB banners, and you might be able to relate that <laughs> to a particular version of, uh, of software. Uh, what kind of authentication is used? I support a list of, um, of authentication types, so I may recognize authentica uh, authentication types other than VNC, Apple Remote Desktop, or no authentication at all, but I won't be able to specify if it was true or false because I haven't implemented the specific authentication type but it, uh, it can list uh, some more authentication uh, methods. And uh, what kind of server name? Well, that's, uh, that's also trivial from the RFB log. So we have seen why it's interesting to parse RFB because of all the stuff that, uh, where we put VNC in nowadays uh, without thinking. Uh, we have seen how RFB works and where information uh, is coming from when we parse it. And we all have, yeah, it wasn't really a how-to, but we've seen some of the steps that it takes to build a protocol parser. Uh, and we have also seen that we can answer the research questions that we posed ourselves in the beginning with this. Uh, so during passive audits, you can now make, or if you enter all your logs into Splunk, you can have your dashboards like, these are all the VNC servers in my network, and these are all the connections. That's actually quite fun. So the first version of the RFB parser was committed back in April, and I think it will be in the 2.5 release, so you can uh, play around with that. There's also some future work uh, because I would really like to ho handle much more corner cases and authentication types that are obviously somewhere out there in the wild. There seems to be a rumor that VNC supports TLS, that you halfway, one of the authentication types is uh, I'm going to switch to certificates and SSL and uh, that kind of uh, secure and complex stuff. I haven't seen it in the wild, but if anyone has ever set up VNC using TLS, I would like to know, because then I can attach the SSL analyzer, hopefully, to the VNC um, parser. And I would really love to be able to generate the screenshot files from the initial screen update, which I uh, mentioned before. Uh, I didn't get it to work uh, uh, for this presentation. Um, I'm also not sure whether or not we should generate screenshot files or that we should make an ASCII art representation in the RFB log files. Uh, if you have any suggestions on that, I'd be happy to know. Uh, also, uh, this is my email address. You can send PCAPs to me uh, if you think that you have some outrageous uh, RFB implementation that you feel should be parsed by the VNC analyzer, and I would be happy to take a look at it. Um, and actually, uh, that was already my last slide. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to take questions, and uh, if there are no questions, we can always, you can always find me later on. Hi. Uh, yes, yes it is. So if you can, uh, and it's uh, enabled by default, I believe, so if you just install it, and uh, you can use the, the test pick, uh, PCAPs in the testing directory. Uh, there's a traces directory with all the test cases, so there are already two PCAPs to toy, uh, to toy around with. No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I do know that. Oh, sorry. I do know that uh, the question was: Is RFB being used for other things than uh, than VNC? Uh, I haven't seen it being used for anything, and the messages are also very descriptive in sending uh, pixel information. I do know that there are uh, many extensions to the VNC uh, or the RFB protocol, which aren't really uh, official. Uh, RFB stuff, but uh, a lot of the VNC servers nowadays uh, uh, support file uploads, uh, USB sharing, and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think it's official RFB spec, uh, but um, it would be fun to see if, uh, if we can do something with that. But it's really specific for, uh, for the VNC uh, use case. So if there are no further questions, um, if, if you come across a question, you can always ask me. Oh, yeah. I like the idea of the screenshot, obviously. It's something you can uh, easily uh, speed up the food chain, too. <laughs> That's what I found on the network. But um, is, the, um, is your method?
methodology there that you just um, decompress each individual with uh, its uh, corresponding um, compression. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then stitch it back together. Is it that simple? It actually is because Jonathan already made a uh, Python uh, script uh, to do that because uh, using his uh, during his research he wanted to, uh, to see how it works uh, and he already did that uh, for the initial screen update. Uh, but uh, when I tried to do it uh, later on because he did that early this year, my PCAPs contained all kinds of uh, compression algorithm and enumerations that weren't really in the spec, so I didn't really know what kind of uh, um, compression algorithm they use. But if you know the compression types, it is basically as simple as uh, decompressing the blocks and just stitching them together. And there are uh, some, uh, there's some libraries out there that actually can play back the whole RFB video for you. So it, it can be done. But um, I, I wouldn't exactly know how I would do it in Bro, though. <laughs> so it would be uh, possible to, to have like a, a Python script that does all the work for you. But I, I was wondering if we can make like a bin pack protocol to PNG kind of uh, parser. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but it's really something that uh, I like to work on on weekends uh, when it's uh, raining outside. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.